And then in 1742, in the little kingdom of Gorka, which is to the west, northwest of Kathmandu, a man called Prithi Narayan Sai came to the throne. Prithi Narayan's family had been there since the 1500s. They had been Rajputs who'd fled from the Mughals. And Prithi, Prithi Narayan Sai was a great, he was a great man. He was a man with a vision. And his vision was to take all these little states, these little feuding fiefdoms, and unite them all into one country. Now, this wasn't an original idea. Other people had thought of it before. Uh, little states that were a bit stronger than their neighbors had marched into the next door state, killed all the men, enslaved the women, eaten, eaten all the goats, uh, and five years later there'd be a rising that they'd all be thrown out again. And Prithi Narayan said, we will take you over, but we will not change the law. We will not change anything. We will not enslave you. Uh, we will not kill you. We will simply take you over. And instead of paying tax to the Raja of Taplejung or whoever, you will pay tax to me. And this was something new. This was quite extraordinary. Um, and he started to absorb all these other little kingdoms. Um, he himself didn't see the final unification into what is now Nepal, uh, but his sons carried it on after him. Um, some of his methods wouldn't necessarily meet the approval of the United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, on one occasion, he sent a message to the Raja of Tansen, which is um, not very far away, saying, would you care to join me in my great crusade for a, for a for national polity? And the Raja of Tansen said, no, thank you very much. So Prithi Narayan said, well, why don't you come along and, and discuss it with me? And um, the Raja of Tansen and his entourage <coughs> trekked across Nepal into Gorkha, climbed up to Prithi Narayan's Durbar, his palace, which is still there, uh, there's no road up to it. You have to walk all the way up this hill. There is a helipad on the top. You're only allowed to use that if you're the king of Nepal. Now there is no king of Nepal, so quite who's allowed to use it, I don't know. Um, but the Raja of Tansen flogged his way all up the hill, um, and as he came in through the door, Prithi Narayan's soldiers fell on him and slaughtered him. And they sent another message back to the Darbar, to the government in, in Tansen, and said, now would you like to reconsider the reason they were able to do this was not only did Prithi Narayan not alter the laws of the states that he took over, he simply said, you pay the tax to me and not to whoever you were paying it to before, but also because he had a regular army. Now, this was extraordinary. This was most unusual for the time. Uh, nobody had professional armies. Uh, you called up an army when you needed it, which was usually an untrained, badly disciplined, pretty poorly armed rabble. And if your rabble was a bit better than the next door chap's rabble, you probably won. Um, Prithi Narayan had a regular army, a proper army that was paid and organized. Uh, and of course, this is the point, it had to be paid. Now, the only source of revenue at this time was land tax. It wasn't revenue from anything else. Nepal didn't have any coal or gold or, or precious spices or anything like that. It was land tax. So the land tax paid the army. But as he conquers more and more land, of course, he needs more and more soldiers to hold that land. And therefore, he needs more and more money to pay them. So therefore, he needs more and more land. So the whole thing is a spiral. You capture more land to raise more money, but you need more soldiers to hold it. Therefore, you need more land to, to pay those soldiers. And they expanded, and they expanded, and they expanded. They took over Sikkim in the east and Garhwal in the west. They even invaded Tibet at one stage. Um, there was a bit of a problem here because the Gorkha army wore red jackets and white belts and for some extraordinary reason gave their orders in English. Now presumably this is because they were copying what the East India Company was doing in, in, um, in India. But the result was a very stiff note from the Chinese emperor uh, to the British government saying, why have you invaded my country? And the British had to say, it's not us, thank you, it's, 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 it's these Gorkhas, thank you, us. For a while, the emperor of China actually paid tribute to the king of Nepal uh, until he realized just quite how tiny Nepal was. And eventually, of course, population and, and, and money won uh, and the Gorkhas pulled back, uh, back into Nepal. So where are we going to go next? We have to go somewhere. We've got to keep raising re revenue to, to pay the soldiers. Well, the only place we can go uh, is to go south where the cattle and the women are fat and anything you throw into the ground just grows up just like that. And this, of course, meant that they invaded India, which brought them in, into conflict with the British uh, in the form of the, of the East India Company. Uh, the Second World War, of course, 
um, Burma is the big Gorkha campaign in the Second World War. Um, put this one up because that's Mad Mike Calvert on the left, who was the brigade commander of one of the Chindit columns. Um, the chap on the right is Major Jimmy Lumley, father of uh, Joanna Lumley, actress and campaigner. Um, his beard's looking a bit scruffy. Um, but of course, it wasn't just in, in Burma that Gurkhas served. They served in Italy uh, and North Africa, etc. as well. Old Gurkhas often say to me, why weren't we at Normandy? Why weren't we on D-Day? Um, was it prejudice? I said, no, no. <laughs> there weren't any Gurkha battalions to go to Normandy. They were all tied up in Italy uh, or, or in the Far East. But they fought in most, um, most of our, our theatres. One of the things they were very good at in Italy, Italy, as you know, uh, was a very difficult campaign. Again, very difficult terrain because you're having to go across the grain as opposed to along the grain. Um, and very often you weren't really sure where the front line was. You weren't quite sure where the enemy was and where you were. Gurkhas, being countrymen who live halfway up the Himalayas, um, are very good at night. They're not afraid of the dark. They can move around at the night. night. They, they understand ground. And what they were very good at was going out sneaky-beaky at night, finding a German patrol and, and killing them. You usually kill all but one. You leave one awake so he can go back and tell his chums and, and make them even more frightened. But somebody said to them, but how do you tell, I mean, this is at night, how do you tell who are British and who are Germans? Ah, very simple, they said. The Germans lace their boots like this and the British lace their boots like that. So suddenly in the whole of Italy, people who thought they'd sort of kick a cock a snook at the system by lacing their boots the wrong way, immediately start lacing their boots uh, the correct way. And they would go along at night and feel the laces. And if the laces were crossed, and if the laces were like this, you were okay. Um, then, of course, after the war, uh, Malaya and, and Borneo, both campaigns, which were very much, I mean, there were British troops there as well, uh, British battalions would do one tour in Malaya uh, or Borneo, and that would be it. Gagas of course, went back again and again and again. Um, and people from that think, well, Gagas are jungle soldiers, aren't they? Well, they're only jungle soldiers because they're trained to be jungle soldiers. They don't live in the jungle. Um, they, they live halfway up the Himalayas. There, there is jungle in Nepal, right down on the south, the top of the plain of Bengal, but nobody actually lives there. They're jungle soldiers because they're trained to be jungle soldiers. And, and actually, they are capable of being trained for just about anything. Uh, the Falklands, of course, one Gagas battalion, they were terribly disappointed when they came back, the 7th Gurkhas, a lot of them I talked to, and they said, Saab, every time we got near them, they ran away. And the reason they ran away was the Argentines were victims of their own propaganda. They said in the newspapers, the British are deploying Gurkhas. Gurkhas, when they run out of rations, eat their own dead. They do not take prisoners, they kill them, and they eat them. That is actually not true. Uh, but the Argentines thought it was. Uh, and as the commanding officer of that battalion, David Morgan, said, if your reputation will do the work for you, uh, well and good, it, it saves you casualties. And actually, Gurkha casualties in the Falklands were, were very, very light. Uh, Bosnia, they were particularly good at Bosnia. They became really very well known in Bosnia by being able to sniff out arms catches, caches. For some reason, they, they could work out where people would hide weapons. Uh, and they were, they were jolly good at that. Um, East uh, Kosovo, of course, they were the lead battalion into Kosovo when it was thought that the Serbs would fight. Actually, they didn't, as it happened. Perhaps if it hadn't been Gorkas, they might have done, but they, they didn't. Um, the par the uh, East Timor, where they deployed under command of, uh, of the Australians, um, and, uh, of course, uh, Sierra Leone, where the parachute company, Gorka Parachute Company, uh, was deployed. Iraq War, the fighting bet, this chap's a sniper. Um, who was a recruit of mine, and I saw him some time after the war fighting bit, and I said, what are you doing now? He said, Saab, I am a sniper, and I am a Lance Corporal. Here's my sniper's badge. And I said, ah, so what are you doing? And, he, and you'll remember that uh, during the war fighting bit of Iraq, just before the British went into Basra, there was a halt to allow the Iraqi army to think better, also because we didn't actually want to get involved in fighting in built-up areas, which is always difficult. And all the snipers were taken out and they were put in hides. They were put in buildings, houses, little hills, and given the usual orders that all snipers are told, kill signalers, kill officers. So anybody with a radio antenna, kill them, 
officer kill him. The reason for that, of course, is if you can destroy your enemy's command and control system, then instead of being an organized army, it simply becomes an armed rabble and a lot easier to deal with. Now, modern sniper's rifle, you will kill a man at a mile. Not only will you kill him, but you can count the spots on his face as you do it. Which is why when you select a sniper, you just don't select a good shot. Obviously, he's got to be a good shot, but there's far more to it than that. Anybody will kill in, cold, in hot blood. Anybody. When the adrenaline's up, he'll kill. It, not everybody will kill in cold blood. So for a sniper, you need somebody who will wait hour after hour after hour until he gets the target and will then quite cold-bloodedly kill him. So I said to this lad, but by the time you did that, the Iraqi army had thrown away its uniforms. They were all in civilian clothes. You were actually fighting the Mujahideen. How did you know who were the officers? And he said, very simple, Saab. Anybody with a mobile phone waving his arms about, I shot him. <laughs> so, so there are going to be an awful lot of O2 contracts in Basra that won't be, won't be met. What about tomorrow? We've, we've, I've talked a lot about today. What about tomorrow? It's not all rosy. Um, I would like to think that the reason we survive is because we're good, and we are good. By any measurable uh, standard of military competence, Gurkhas are way ahead of anybody else in the army. And I'm not being pejorative or rude about the rest of the army. The rest of the army is bloody good. They're doubly bloody good. But if you look at basic fitness tests, combat fitness tests, annual uh, rifle classification, uh, retention, recruitment, disciplinary records, and everything else, they're miles ahead. But politicians are not interested in quality, they're interested in cost. And the reason we've survived is largely because we've been very, very cheap. Much, much cheaper than a British soldier. Now, of course, now that the Gurkha's terms of service are the same as British terms, we will become much more expensive. Why? The average British infantry soldier serves four and a half years and goes. Doesn't, doesn't qualify for a pension. Every Gurkha will stay in as long as he possibly can. Why would you leave the army? You'd be mad. It's like whenever we had a general visiting, I, I always used to say, don't, don't ask them if they like the army because they'll think you're mad. Why wouldn't they? Uh, and don't ask them what do their fathers think of them being in the army because they'll think you're mad. Uh, now, of course, you ask British soldiers those sort of questions. Don't ask Gurkhas. Um, now, if every Gurkha soldier serves on to pension, that's more expensive. If Gurkha soldiers' entitlement to married quarters is the same as British soldiers, Gurkhas marry young. There's a much higher percentage of married Gurkhas in an infantry battalion or, or a, one of the corps regiments uh, than there is in, in the British equivalent. So that makes us more expensive. And the other problem and I think Miss Lumley is a lovely woman. I've met her several times. She's a delightful woman. But it's all very well to say the boys can stay in England. Well, it's a no-brainer. They fought for us. Why shouldn't they stay in England? Why shouldn't they live in England? I mean, we let half the population of Somaliland in, and they've never done anything for us, except draw the dough. Um, so it's a no-brainer. But it's not as simple as that. The government of Nepal has always been perfectly happy. And remember, Nepal is not part of the Commonwealth. It's never been a colony, never been part of the empire, never been conquered. They don't mind. They've never minded us going into Nepal, taking the pick of their young men, taking them away, and sending them back 20 years later. Because the boys send money back to Nepal, to their families. And it's hard currency. Nepali rupee is not convertible. Nobody wants a Nepali rupee. One of the major sources, now the major source, because tourism has gone down, of hard currency, convertible currency, is the British Army, people sending uh, money home. Pensions paid in the Nepal in hard currency in sterling. Now, if the boys are all going to live here, there's not going to be any money being sent back to Nepal. There isn't pension money going back to Nepal. So what's in it for the Nepal government? Um, and I don't know. Normally, at the moment, Nepal is almost in, this, in a, almost a failed state. It is in such chaos that the government is most unlikely to care about anything. When there is a government, and there may be one this weekend, it hasn't been for some time. So probably it doesn't matter yet, but it, but it could matter later on. Um, and then there is, as I said, the, the question of cost. I think as long as Afghanistan is going on, as long as there are little wars to fight, we're probably okay. We do have the British public like Gawkers. Um, 
But nevertheless, and I always say to the boys, you know, don't be too complacent uh, because cost in this life is what matters. Your quality. But if we're expensive or if we're too expensive, then, um, then that may be, may be the end.